The following audio was originally recorded live and broadcast to the facilities of Trent Radio on October 18th, 2019. I'm Justin Evangelo. This is Disenabled, the show where we enable the disabled. Great to be back for another episode. This is the one factor keeping me sane in a life of first year at university madness. Midterm season is hectic. I've had a crazy week and I'm sure everyone listening has as well. Today, I've got a longer interview segment and it was done with a newly made friend of mine, who, like me, has suffered sight loss, although his story is a little bit different. I hope you enjoy. I don't want to delve too deep into introductions for the sake of, well, first, brevity because of the length of the interview segment, and also he does a very good job of introducing himself. So, without any further ado... Brett LeBlanc, my newly made friend, if one can agree with that (laughs) statement. Um, Let's just start basically like I've started before by telling everybody what your physical disability is. I was born with a condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, It's an extremely rare condition. It's about one in every 200,000. It's a genetic eye disorder. Um, It's sort of, there's no universal sort of way. It's different person to person. Um, In my case, it impairs roughly 94% of my vision. So in total, I have less than 1% in my right eye and right around 6% of my left eye. Okay, last week I interviewed someone with meningococcal meningitis and I talked about more or less the physical aspects of their disability and how it impacted them uh, emotionally. Uh, They mentioned that people would take pictures of them and they could obviously see it. This week I want to take more of a social approach. In a social setting that's foreign to you, let's say you go somewhere with some friends and you're having a good time, you're meeting up with newer people in a a group setting. Do you ever receive any sort of commentary after the fact from your friends or from anyone else that strikes you as a little odd because of your behavior? Whether it be, dude, why did you look at me that way? Or why are you so stone-faced or anything like that? Honestly, not not generally after the fact. My friends are usually pretty like <laughs> open and, yeah they'll, they'll kind of tell me on the spot okay you know what I mean? like, yeah well, um, good yeah. okay can you give an example of an instance where that's happened it doesn't have to be recent right i don't know i think maybe there's just little things with say like social cues like you say an eye contact thing for mm-hmm. me my way of perceiving eye contact with someone is obviously going to be different from someone who's sighted right. just because of like, the limitations of my vision so mm. that sort of requires me to look at them in a certain way. Do you, um, so maybe, you know, something like that. But. Do you feel that people in a social setting who you don't know and who aren't familiar with your disability talk to you any different or approach you in any different way in conversation? Absolutely. I think it's not necessarily intentional all the time, but um, like in other words, I don't think people are consciously trying to treat me different. It's just that's the way it comes across sometimes. And not to say that everybody does. I think it's different person to person. I don't want to generalize and say, you know, people come in with that. But realistically, we all have biases and, and that obviously factors in, you know. I'm all about the examples, right? Mm-hmm. In order not to generalize, you have to give, sure. you have to put it into context. So can you list off any sort of specific instances where people have not downgraded per se, but you can tell the treatment of you is different in a social setting? Yeah, I think, I mean, generally, again, I think it's maybe people just not having the awareness, like they don't, mm-hmm. they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the interactions. Like, for example, for me, it tends to be like more of people that I don't have a previous relationship with, like people I may have just met for the first time. For sure, yeah, that's what I mean. You know what I mean? Like people that sort of see me or see the cane might just kind of act differently. And an example, it's not recent, but just as a kid, when I'd be like out with my parents and let's say like I was at the mall, for example, and someone would kind of come up to me 
and then they would start talking to my parents instead of me. Yeah. Instead, you know, talking yeah. to me like in the third person. It wouldn't be directed at you right. per se right. because they thought, well, he can't see, so he's not going to exactly. know I'm talking to him. Now, this is a question I've asked before and I'll ask now. What is one of the craziest, most frustrating, most infuriating, unique experiences you've had? They can be all or none of the above. <laughs> Just one experience that sticks out to you in context and or in conjunction with your disability like it was fueled by it i don't know i just try i try not to let things like that affect <laughs> yeah. me you know it's th- things happen i generally speaking i mean people i have not a lot of issues per se again like i, I think it's just the f- people that don't necessarily know how to interact and they just are coming from a place of ignorance and I, I don't know that necessarily something stands out that okay it was so infuriating to no me, right you know? right yeah Okay, let's move to the physical aspect of the disability then. In terms of navigation, especially around an unfamiliar area, Mm -hmm. first of all, what are your keys to success when you're in an unfamiliar area and you you know you need to navigate? Well, there's there's a number of things. First, I'm a cane user, so I, I rely a lot on my cane skills to sort of point out things that are in the physical environment around me. Also, like, listening and just relying on my other senses is obviously more important when the use of one of my senses isn't is very limited so to sort of compensate for that obviously using like hearing picking up on you know smells things like that that just sort of distinguish certain aspects of it and obviously just sort of identifying landmarks and just to sort of help familiarize myself with the area so for example you know if there's a certain type of tree or something that stands out where that's located in relation to where I am, you know, on the street, for, for example, whatever that may be. So I think there's a number of things that just go into that. For sure. To rationalize why I'm asking that, a lot of people who are sighted ask about the interesting behaviors of someone who is visually impaired or blind navigating in a certain area like why are they sticking close to such and such Mm -hmm. a wall Mm -hmm. or why are they glancing around and because there's the perception that all people who have a cane are automatically fully blind right and that's just that's just not the case (laughs) so why are they looking around they can't see anyway Uh, so I, i think it's good to just sort of put that to to bed or try to and and quash the ignorance on that score in terms of people assisting you when it appears as if you don't know where you're going, mm-hmm. how would you describe your experiences with that? Well, I think there's kind of been examples on both sides of that, good and bad. I'd like to think in, in all cases people are well-intentioned that are trying to, you know, they feel like, oh, this person might be struggling and... I want to help them, so it's coming from a place of kindness, I'd like to think, Um, maybe not always. So, I mean, in some cases, I think some of the positive experiences have been people just kind of knowing the right way to approach it and saying like, hey, do you need any help with such, and if you need anything, just let me know, like that sort of thing, versus somebody just sort of assuming that their way is is best and just sort of taking over the situation sort of thing. So like, I understand there's different personalities, people have a different perspective on things and and that's fine, but uh, yeah, typically just maybe asking the person, not just in the case of people who are visually impaired, you know, people that are whatever disability they may have. Yeah, any sort of physical. Just approaching them in a way like they're equal to you and you know, do you need anything? Can I help you? Uh, You you don't also want it to come out of a place of pity and that's what you see quite a lot with, oh, why'd you help that poor fellow across the street? Oh, he's blind and I felt so (laughs) sorry for him. It's, well, at least from my perspective, it's pretty degrading. Sure. Dehumanizing. Right, for sure, because you're being treated as if, well, you're a child and here you are, you know, a 20-something year old trying to accomplish the most basic task and you can't because one of your senses is dulled. Because you've had this disability since birth, Mm -hmm. have you ever had to develop any coping strategies in order to, let's just say, manage it? And what I mean by that is manage it in public opinion or in the public eye. It's been severely pointed out and so you've had to not resort to changing your ways of functioning in society but adapt to it? That's a great question. I don't know if there's necessarily any coping mechanisms per se. I think it's more just, in my case, it's been more about uh, 
just sort of how I interpret things, how I perceive cognitively. So just not so much a way of how do I deal with this, but sort of how I can manage it. And it's just, it's a daily thing. I mean, I don't think there's any universal way to, to cope with, with having a disability. For sure. I think yeah. everybody has their own. So what works for you, what works for you in that setting then? I, or is it so ingrained within you now that you couldn't live? Yeah, it's like, like you say, like I was born with it. Yeah. It's just, it's sort of always been there. I mean, as a kid, I think I had a more difficult time dealing with it in school. I was, you know, starting in elementary school, being the only blind kid at school. And it was very apparent that I was both to me and to the other students. So I think that was frustrating being like labeled as, as being different. But as I got older and as I sort of accepted it, I just sort of, just realize that that's who I am. That's um, I, it doesn't have to define me as a person, but it's it's always going to be there. And I think people, I mean, labeling theory is a, is a real thing. People just just like to label things, and that that can happen. But uh, just accepting what what you have and and just doing the best you can. In every right. Place, yeah. You know? Playing, you know, with the with the hand you're dealt. Yeah. Exactly. Is uh, the best way. You know how. Yep. Okay. Well, with the colder and slippery. Or weather coming up, as clearly indicated by the rain today. Yes. What a treacherous trek that was. Is there any sort of special things you'd like people to know when they see anybody with a cane navigating a little bit more treacherous terrain because of the elements? Uh, I mean, again, I think it's getting back to one of your previous questions about just like, you know, how people would approach a visually impaired or blind person navigating. I would sort of say it's a similar thing like if the person looks like they're struggling don't automatically assume that you know oh i, sh- I have to go over and help this poor person like, right help them right more you know if they if maybe you can approach them and say like hey is there anything i can help you with is everything good mm-hmm. and then sort of let that person respond but with respect to this specific elements as what they are i don't know there's necessarily something you know that attitude it's it's really case well it's, it's case by case obviously yeah, right yeah. segueing beautifully then What's been your largest form of support in terms of learning how to manage in all aspects, not just with physical navigation, uh, with your disability, whether it be family or school officials, administrators? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's a combination. Family, of course. Uh, you know, my parents and my immediate family, obviously they grew up with me and they sort of helped me. Uh, acclimate to, to certain things of course they still do in certain ways but as I got older the, definitely the peer groups that I had formed close friends would help with that would, and again just the, the attitude thing where like you know people looking at me as being different that thing just getting over that and surrounding myself with the right people that didn't necessarily look at my disability as, as being something that defined me but rather just sort of accepting it and, and treating me like everyone else so I, I think starting with family, peers, school officials in, in some ways, definitely, as mm-hmm. well. But uh, i say family and peers were, were probably the most influential. Final subtopic, I guess you could call it. You're in your first year's master's psychology, which is terrific. And of course, there's the academic accommodations to consider right. as well, whether it be through the technology that's needed or the special accommodations that aren't technological that need to be put in place as well, such as extra time for test writing, et, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have you been judged differently or not exactly denied certain accommodations, but you've had to fight for them because of your disability due to people... Okay. Lo- yeah, lo- you get it. Looking mm-hmm. not down upon, but viewing them d- differently. Well, I'll, I'll say in, in the case of here at Trent, I've had a very positive experience generally with like student accessibility, with the Center for Academic Testing. They've been very, very good and, and advocated for me when needed. More so, I guess, maybe during elementary school and sort of just... I think maybe other students and that, maybe just, again, not having the knowledge as to why I needed certain accommodations. I think maybe potentially there could have been issues there, but generally it's been it's been pretty positive, especially since I arrived here at Trent. Does that rule apply for your elementary and high school experience, or in those areas have you had to fight at times to keep pace yeah, like, with like, your like, with I, like I say, it's, it's more of a lack of knowledge, and again, not just from students, but from teachers to... I think in a lot of cases I was the first visually impaired right. student. Right. Yeah. Had, so they so didn't they, know how to react. Exactly. 
which is amazing because you've paved the way for me here. I, can, <laughs> I can't thank you enough for that. This is it's much easier experience, I imagine, than sure. what you've had to in, <laughs> endure. Final question. Is there any other after notes you would like people to know? Maybe a summative sort of statement that would reach out beyond those with sight loss pertaining to all those with physical disability? I don't know if I can do justice to like a perfect sort of statement to sum it up, but I just generally speaking, I think it's like a kind of been a recurring theme throughout this interview is just don't treat people with physical disabilities as being any different than any of your able-bodied friends or, or peers. I mean, just because they have some sort of physical limitation doesn't sort of limit them in other ways apart from, you know, directly resulting from their disability. So I guess just treating them as an equal as uh, as you would want to be treated. Terrific. Getting very biblical with that <laughs> statement. Fred LeBlanc, everybody, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day to do this. That was so much fun to do with him, and I love his answer to the last question of not being able to do it justice because at the end of the day, a lot of people who have a different disability than the one being talked about try to do justice to all people with physical disabilities or all disabilities as a rule and say these great statements which may not apply to everybody so kudos to him a couple of points i'd like to touch on the first being the notion of helping someone with sight impairment and the distinction between taking pity on them or helping them because you genuinely want to and it's coming out of a place where you view them as an equal. A lot of the times in both of our experiences, I talked to Brett a little bit more after the segment was recorded. You find that people help those with sight impairment and who are blind because they feel sorry for them. So many times I've been walking solo and there's a busy intersection and I've been taught how to cross it. And so is Brett. And a person will simply come up and say, oh, let me take your arm and just do it without even asking consent from whoever it is trying to cross the street. That's why it's vitally important to educate oneself on this particular subtopic because it's a huge issue. Ignorance itself doesn't come out of a place of rudeness. You can't help lacking in knowledge because obviously you don't know you're doing it. Hence why I'm talking to whoever may be listening right now. In the event that you are one of these people or you've experienced this, it's very dehumanizing, even if the person means the best and they have the greatest intentions. If that's the case, all you have to do is ask. And this is what I tell a lot of even my, my friends or at times, even my close family, just ask. Ask if you need help. Don't just assume it. And don't ever come at someone with a sight impairment or anybody with a physical disability in terms of physical navigation with pity because they're just as equal as you are. It's just the disability that's causing them a slight complication. It's not what defines them. And that's also what I tried to communicate too when I had Kayla Gaspar, my previous guest, last week on the show. That's exactly what she said. Don't let it define you. As you can clearly see, Brett and Kayla don't, which is terrific. From an academic perspective, and I'll elaborate on this more so with reading week rolling around in my next episode. Academic accommodations and the skewed viewpoint of those with physical disabilities as a causal link is very interesting to me. There's a concept that if you have a physical disability and you need academic accommodations, that you lack intelligence. Because there's a lumping, when someone hears the word disability, they automatically think in terms of academia that the person possessing it is of less intelligence, which is simply not the case at all especially with those with physical disabilities. Just because someone needs a little bit longer to write a test does not mean they're not as smart or smarter than any sighted person is. I'm gonna leave that on the table for now to discuss later. Essentially, the point that I wanted to get across was just because there are special accommodations needed and at times people with the physical disabilities may have to fight for them does not mean that different 
treatment should be given to the person who needs them. The accommodations are there to make sure they are equal, not that they have an advantage. Finally, my last point, navigation-wise, I'm segueing back into it. Winter's coming up, and it's very treacherous out there when the snow flies and things start to freeze over. If you see someone with, with or without sight impairment, it doesn't matter, with a physical disability, struggling, all you have to do is ask. And a lot of the time, what I see, and yes, from what I can see, I know it's very limited, as I've communicated before, but what, from what I can see in, in, in my experience is those who are fully sighted, able-bodied, try to lend a helping hand to someone who has a physical disability. I've heard time and time again, oh, they were so rude when I was trying to help them. And I asked why, and they said, oh, they didn't even look at me when I helped them. They just walked away and said thank you to me without even giving me a second glance. And I think to myself, okay, sometimes, especially in the case of someone who can't see, they can't see you. Social cues, facial expressions, and body communication are something that, that are weak spots for people who especially can't see. The criticism is appreciated. Make it inquiry-based. And what I mean by that is if you're helping somebody and don't understand why they're not looking at you, don't understand why they're not even looking in your general direction, ask them, hey, why, why aren't you doing this? Or I noticed you did this. Why do you do that? A lot of the time, they won't take it offensively on the spot. And there are times when they may not even notice they're doing it because it's so natural to them. They haven't honed that skill because it's not one of the primary ones they need to get around. Anyway, I love ranting too. Whoever listens, it's terrific. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great reading week to all Trent students, and I'll see you next Friday.